Okay. The last two themes I want to cover in Lord of the Rings are the nature of heroism or virtue and the nature of restoration. And there's one final little tag I'll put on that at the end, so technically there'll be five, but there are four major ones and one sort of more subtle one that I wanted to sort of leave you with at the end of this lecture. In this one, the nature of heroism or virtue, this is a subject that is, I find, not necessarily common in evangelical and Protestant circles. Coming out of the Middle Ages, and into the Reformation with Luther sort of very staunchly saying, it's not by, by my works, but by Christ's works. And a real robust, good rediscovery of Paul's understanding of the work of Christ has at times made Protestants and evangelicals allergic to the subject of talking about what a virtuous person or a, a hero uh, in, the, in the literary sense ought to look like. There's all kinds of subtle ways this shows up. There are all kinds of ways that people will avoid discussion of Christian living or of sanctification itself. Now, just to put on my, my theological hat for a while, I, I have been saying this for a little while now. I think the missing link for most people in their understanding of the move from justification to sanctification is the concept of adoption. The Bible doesn't move so quickly, seamlessly, from you are justified in the courtroom sense. The gavel bangs, not guilty. The, the, the blood of Christ has covered your sins. The robes of His righteousness are now your robes covering your guilt. But we then move from that to the concept of sanctification almost immediately, which if you're not out of the courtroom yet, the idea of what must I do to be an a inculcated cultural, culturally speaking, not cultural Christian, but a culturally speaking, uh, what does it mean to be part of the family of God, stays in the courtroom. And so, if any of you have stood before a judge, I have, uh, I'll tell you that story some other time, um, uh, you don't love the judge. It doesn't matter if he's nice and pleasant and bangs the gavel and says, you're not guilty. You want out of the courtroom as fast as possible. You don't want to stay in the courtroom and ask the, the judge out to lunch. You want him gone. And so what happens with people is, is mentally, they move from the concept of gavel bang, not guilty, justification subjects, and there's more to justification than just the gavel bang, but still, that's where they stand. And then they move over to sanctification, which is how are, how are, we, be made, how are we being made Christ-like? And it still feels like it's the, it's the justification motif worked out in sanctification. It's what must I do to stay justified now, or something like this, effectively. I always say the missing link is, is adoption. Because biblically speaking, we go from you have been justified, and your faith in Christ's work counts you as if you had done the work yourself. His robes, again, cover you. You are then adopted as an heir and part of the kingdom of God, part of the family of God. You are now a son and daughter of the king. And as I always say, even if you don't have great relationships with your parents, even if you had awful parents, you could at least in your mind's eye think of a great father, the kind of father that loves you and treats you with respect and nurtures you and disciples you and all these wonderful things that we know that at least some fathers in the world still do. I and mean, if you can at least think of that, you should know that when you're in that environment and you're with your father whom you love and you respect and you want to be like, when your father comes up and says, come on, son, or come on, girl, like you shouldn't be this way. You don't have to be this way. You're my daughter. You're my son. You don't have to be this way. It's still just the same push to, to not do things and to be like other things. But in the context of the family of adoption, uh, again, you, you see this all the time in kids. They just want to be like their mother or their father. They want to be like their parent. The adoption motif then, in other words, takes you out of the courtroom and puts you into the family of God. And that is exactly where Hebrews takes us, right? And it talks about being disciplined, which means God 
punishes us some temporal way, that he takes things out of our hands, he, he, he closes doors that we think ought to stay open. And what does Hebrews say? Well, you're a child, and sometimes your, your parent will discipline you, but it's out of love. He is not saying, well, yeah, the judge said not guilty, but you know, you still got to kind of watch out because he's, he's got some surveillance on you, and if you still do stuff, you might make your way back into the courtroom. And so what I have found is when people begin to reflect on the adoption motif, we are sons and daughters of the king, it actually, I find, alleviates some of this tension that some Protestants in their eagerness to defend justification in Christ's work, and we don't earn anything for our salvation, what they're missing is the enculturation of the family of God into our lives. Who we are is no longer the judge center in the courtroom. We're now part of the family. And whenever you're part of a good family, you want to be more and more part of the family. You want to inculcate what your dad loves to do, you want to do. What he, what he doesn't like, you end up not wanting to do, these kinds of things. Let's talk about confession. If you're in front of a judge, you confess as little as possible. You plead the fifth. You, you hold back. No, no contest. You do whatever you can to not get extra penalty on top of things. If you're in a context of love with your father, you will confess things to that father. You, 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 will, you will open up about the, the things that are in you that are, that are provoking things in the context of love and discipleship, right? Well, I think that what this means for us in terms of this engagement with Tolkien is when, when Tolkien is dealing with what does it look like to be a hero, what does it mean to have people in the, in the narrative or in the story that we can look at and go, that's a great example of things. It's okay to, to actually feel the impulse to want to kind of be that way. I, to translate this to the biblical texts, it's not always good to preach, you know, hey, we see David is after God's own heart, now go do that yourself. Why? Because you're telling people, or else. But it is perfectly acceptable, I think, to say Dave, David knew his role. He, he was humble before God. He confessed his sins to, the, to God. And he was after God's own heart because he was loyal to God. And are you humble? Do you realize that you're infinitely loved? Do you realize you're part of the family? And that you can confess and be humble and you don't have to, to, to do these things as well? Heroism, in other words, takes on a different tone. You can encourage those things, I think. Well, let's get back to Tolkien. Heroism for, for Tolkien is never, uh, I say or is not, but it should be, is never brute strength. Very rarely is it, is, is it ever even dominant strength in that ultimate, you know, you shall not pass Gandalf versus the Balrog sense. Do you see those moments? But very often, heroism is born out of weakness. And I don't mean weakness in the sense of they're weak physically, though that is, is certainly the case with the hobbits. But I mean, heroism born of weakness in the sense of humility. Knowing who you are in, the, the, in this, this journey, in this plan, in this particular mission. Not thinking more of yourselves and thinking more of others. Knowing your role, knowing your place, these kinds of things. That weakness of humility, that Christ-like weakness, Tolkien very, very strongly encourages. And, and I say here at the end, there is a profound virtue of loyalty in all of Tolkien's writings, in particular with several key characters. Well, let's look at a couple examples. Heroism is not brute strength. Obviously, the classic example is just the hobbits. These small, I mean, even just in their physical DNA, the small, diminutive, I mean, in this case, the movies are actually a little more telling than my mind's eye when I read the books, because seeing these little pipsqueaks running around a battlefield trying to, you know, slay the enemy, you can't help but sometimes, in fact, the movie sometimes makes it comical, because they're not really contributing a whole lot physically to the battle. If anything, they're sometimes in the way. But they are, as, 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 one, as it's once put in the books, they're stout-hearted. They know bravery when it needs to be. They are strong, the hobbits are, because they know they're weak. You can't help but know you're weak when you're short and small. And so the hobbits know their place. The other thing on the other side of the coin, though, is they are incredibly brave from time to time. They stick their neck out. And, 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 you know, we, we, this, this is played in the movie as well, in the book, equally so. Frodo standing up saying, I'll take the ring at the Council of Elrond. This almost 
simple, almost stupid way of saying, all right, I'll do it. Like this kind of volunteering to go uh, storm the beach kind of a thing. I'll carry the ring, knowing the, the, the torturous nature that he's going to have to go through. This kind of bravery within the context of fear. A lot of people have commented on this. Bravery doesn't mean lack of fear. It means standing up even in the midst of fear. You're not brave when there's no, nothing to fear. And I say they're stout-hearted for a purpose. They always have a purpose. Another great example of this strength that has a tone of weakness is, of course, the, the character of Gandalf. I've already commented a couple times that here's a guy who, uh, or ca- a character rather, who has a significant amount of power to, to bring to bear if he wanted to. But whether because it's his calling or whether because he chooses not to, at the end of it, Gandalf's power is rarely used. That's actually almost never used in that full sense of, again, Gandalf facing off with the Balrog and, and, and sort of stopping him in his tracks. Gandalf's power is always reserved, and yet Gandalf is very lordly. Rarely does Gandalf walk into a room where people don't actually realize who he is on some fundamental level. The hobbits don't seem to know who he is, but that's out of oblivion. <laughs> the only other place that I can think of, the only other two places where he's not given the full accord as sort of this lordly character is at the kingdoms of Gondor and of Rohan, where he's treated poorly. And he doesn't bluster. He does say, you, you, you should be treating me better than this. But with his stro- but in his strength and his humility, he doesn't actually you know, smite his enemies for, for dissing him, for leaving him out on the, on, the, on, the, on the front porch while he's going in to see the king of Rohan. Gandalf always has a Christ-likeness to him. He is always this strong counselor, follower, leader, but not leading in the sense of, as I would say, standing behind people, kicking them in the, in the direction they need to be going but rather leading himself by example in many ways. And people always say, well, Gandalf dies and comes back. Is that not resurrection-esque language? I think it is. I think Tolkien's, I mean, for as much as Tolkien doesn't want to do allegory, he's also not dumb. He's going to know that people are going to read this as a resurrection motif. He comes back in white. Tolkien knows that people are going to read this as Christological, messianic, however you want to put it. And he doesn't avoid it fully. But he also says this is just but one example of a Christ-like suffering and dying to save others. And Aragorn does the same thing and others do as well. So Gandalf has this sort of lordliness. Now the supreme character in terms of heroism is actually Sam. Tolkien actually says in a letter, I think it's to the publisher, that the hero of the entire Lord of the Rings is actually Sam in his mind. Sam is the, the central character and the central hero of the entire story. I do think that in general, the characterization of Sam in the movies is pretty spot on. I'm thinking in particular of the Fellowship of the Rings, the, the plunging into the river scene. I mean, that, that one for me, I'm like, that's, that's Sam. Like that, that I'm going to walk literally into the river <laughs> of over, water over my head to follow you kind of a concept. That's, that is the, the epitome of Sam in the story. And that, for, 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 for Tolkien, that's the epitome of leadership, humility, and strength. It's ultimate loyalty to the purpose and to the person who you are meant to be serving at that given moment. As I say here, Sam is the hero. He's ultimately humble, ultimately loyal. But there's one thing that's usually overlooked. In, if you take out the, the weird case of Bombadil, which is, of course, he's some sort of angelic, Ainuric creature, There's only one character in the entire book who holds the ring, looks at it, and wears it for a period of time, and hands it back without a second's hesitation. And it's Sam. He actually wears it for a while when Frodo is thought to be dead. He carries it on. He's going to keep the purpose. He weeps over his friend and his master. It's definitely an old classic British sort of master and servant relationship, which sometimes freaks people out, but still. When Sam takes the ring and carries it, he comes back. At the, uh, in the book, it's very clear. He's like, give me the ring back. And Sam's just like, here you go. Like, doesn't even think twice about it. There is this utter strength of loyalty and purpose and knowing his place, a stout-hearted simplicity of following and, oh, and, and doing what is right. That, again, makes, uh, as, as Tolkien says, Sam is the hero of the story in his own way. 
that he is the one who, who is utterly brave in the face of it all. Okay, lastly, the nature of restoration. We've touched on a bit of this before, but I want to really sort of make sure we get this in, in a real structured way. The nature of restoration in Tolkien. Restoration for Tolkien is always in the small and in the large scale. Restoration is, in the Tolkien stories, not only coming to the last homely house or reaching Lothlorien or reaching a place where you can have rest and food and a restoration of the weariness of your journey. Those are the small things. But it's also the big concepts of restoration, of the overthrowing of evil, and of the restoration of Gondor in the, in the ultimate kingdom sense. So he's got big, big restoration in the sense of the, the entire history of Middle-earth has changed with the defeat of Sauron and the coming of Strider to the throne, but also in the small things. And what I say here is there's, there's sort of a twin concept of rest and healing, as I put it. Rest and healing. Rest and healing, and, and lastly, that restoration is incomplete. Let me, let me tell you what I mean by these last three things. Rest, healing, and still, rest is always incomplete. When you look at the feasting <laughs> uh, that people always like to notice, second breakfast, everyone always says, they always like to comment on that and wish they could do it themselves. This idea, of, particularly in the hobbit's life, this idea of constant food and laughter together. The restoration in the small things. When I say rest, I mean literally taking your feet down, uh, uh, t t putting, sorry, putting your feet up rather, getting off the journey, putting yourself off the case for a while and just resting in physically and also emotionally and relationally with others. We might think of those vacation or holidays kinds of things, but it's more than just going away for a trip. It's also having a rhythm of life that at times stops work, that ceases to do these things. And what's interesting about this concept is that there's friendship and there's rest involved. You're always with others in these moments of rest. But here's the thing. The biblical concept of rest, I always say, is not based on the idea that work is bad, but it's based on the idea that you are not God. Whenever you, see, whenever you do not cease to work, whenever you kill yourself with too much work, and we're all susceptible to this, you are, particularly in ministry, this is the biggest ticket item, you are saying, I'm so important that I can't stop working. God can't work without me that I need to kill myself, almost literally, physically, to do all this work. Now, do I think there's, mar there, there's a, a martyr kind of spirit and a self-sacrifice and you, you, you work hard as you can? Yes, of course. There are times where you have to burn the candle at both ends. But when you never cease working, you are saying you are God. You are saying, I am so important that if I don't answer this email right now, if I don't pick up this phone, if I don't leave my kids and go work 19 hours a day in the office or the church or whatever ministry context you're in, that somehow the world is going to fall apart without you. And I'm here to tell you, it will not fall apart without you. It never will. You and I will shuffle off this mortal coil at some point, and God will call other people behind us. It is not on you to save the kingdom. Now, it's a high calling, and again, hard work is part of that life. But with rest, and this is true in Tolkien, there's an there's a, a, a arduous journey that is always punctuated by these moments of rest. These moments are, I mean, he even describes them, they're bathing. I mean, you're just kind of like... They have a nice bath and a long, big dinner, and they sing and they talk, and then they have a, you know, go out and smoke their pipes and those kind of like very Victorian sort of concepts of, of just kicking their feet up for a while. But it's actually profound, and most people are actually drawn to them. These, these concepts of, well, it'd be nice to have, you know, a big party with like 15, you know, meals and lots of fireworks and like, like Bilbo does for his birthday. The concept here is not so much the party, it's the rest. It's the, it's the consider oneself in, in your proper order. You're not the glue holding the world together. You're not the glue holding your ministry together. You're not the glue holding your church together. So let it go. And at times, give yourself into rest. That's rest, though. There's also healing. And healing, in this sense that I'm talking about, is a healing that doesn't come from within yourself, but rather you are being healed. And in this concept, the Lambus bread is obviously the most clearly Eucharistic, sacramental 
overtone of a healing that is both physical and supernatural, the sense of they've been given the lamb is bread to carry them on their, uh, along the way of their journey. And I'm sorry, for as much as Tolkien doesn't want to be allegorical, this is the Eucharist. I'm sorry. This is, this has, this, what else could it be? And I say, he, say here, healing is, is typically from the outside. It's usually healing that is done to someone, the, the giving of certain medicine, that kind of a thing, that kind of concept. What is interesting about Tolkien, and I think this is biblical too, often, again, we have become a little too quasi-gnostic at times in the way we, can, we separate body and soul. We think our soul matters and our body is just going to be thrown away at the end of time. I'm here to tell you, you're going to have a resurrected body, so you're going to get that thing back, but in a glorified state. But what I always say is, go biblically through the, through the chronology, and you'll see how very often, in the, particularly in the Old Testament, but it's there in the New as well, physical restoration is symbolic and intimately tied into the spiritual restoration. Leprosy is not just leprosy. Leprosy is a symbol as well of spiritual chaos in that, either that person's life or in the life of Israel whenever there's outbreaks of leprosy. The healing of a king is not simply the healing of his body, but it's always, always driving at the healing of him for the sake of being a better king, these kinds of things. And I think what Tolkien is driving at here, and he does it very, very well, is he shows that the sustaining of, particularly the hobbits, but of the entire company on their journey to, to end this, this tyranny of Sauron, always has moments where there is outside healing, outside sustenance, a, a kind of picking up their arms and carrying them the rest of the way, which is exactly what the Lambus bread is meant to do. Take one bite and it fully restores you, uh, at least for a period of time. This concept, I say, is very much tied in with what, what I would call covenant rest and sacraments. Covenant rest is another word for what we use for Sabbath. It's, it's covenant renewal. Sabbath, Sunday worship, is very much about covenant renewal. It's not just about singing songs and hearing a sermon and then going to the cafeteria and having a big you know, Sunday lunch. Those things are all wonderful. But what we're there to do is every, every Sabbath is to confess our sins, renew our covenant commitment to the Lord, praise Him for the fact that He has died on the cross for us, and then thank Him with, with, with the singing of songs and the giving of tithes and offerings and the fellowship of the saints for the fact that, that we are part of the covenant community. That the concept of healing, week by week, Sabbath healing, and the rest therein, is a concept that is a vital element to the church. As much as our weekly Bible studies and our weekly sort of rhythms of life in church are, are wonderful and important, there is nothing that is more important than the covenant Sabbath rest and reconciliation at the worship service. And the sacraments that are involved with it as well, preached word, the, the, sac, uh, the Lord's Supper itself, and from time to time, uh, the baptism of the saints. Finally, the nature of restoration, the nature of it, is that it's always, always, always incomplete in Tolkien's universe. I think this is overlooked by a lot of, of secondary works on it. I've mentioned before that the, that the story ends on a bit of a downer note. This idea that you know, that there's sort of a separation of the, of the fellowship. Only Frodo and Bilbo get to go over to, the, to uh, the Grey Havens, the Undying Lands, these things. And what you have at the end is, uh, uh, the other thing that, used, that startled me the first time I read Lord of the Rings is the fact that Hobbiton is still, the Shire is still scarred and broken in its own way after, it doesn't become utopia suddenly. It actually is worse off after the battle than it is ever restored. That there's this element as I say here, that restoration is incomplete because the way I would put it is these are just victories before the final victory. Even the overthrowing of a serious tyrant like Sauron is but a victory in the grand battle that is going to be at the final victory when Christ returns. And so what Tolkien, I think, weaves within this is you can celebrate, you can be joy-filled, you can, th there are moments when the enemy is cast down. In, in, our, in our personal lives or in our corporate lives with churches and ministries, we see breakthroughs, we see all those kinds of things. But these are incomplete victories. 
not incomplete because they themselves were, are, are, are worthless, but in, incomplete because these little victories along the way are not the ultimate victory of all things finally being, being under Christ's feet and every tear wiped away. That is the ultimate final victory. And there's a concept we use theologically where we talk about, it, about Christ's kingdom being now but not yet. The now not yet is this idea that we, we have, I mean, the way I would put it is you read the beginning of Ephesians where it talks about us being seated in the heavenlies. And the average, the, 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 honest, the honest reaction to that is, no, I'm not. I'm down here and I got a backache and I'm, my kids are bugging me and I have a headache. Like, I don't feel like I'm seated in the heavenlies right now. Now, is Paul just sort of using hyperbole? No. But what he's talking about there is that we are united to Christ. And Christ has been fully, res- fully resurrected. He has his glorified body. He is the type, the first fruits of what we will be, as Paul says. He is our head. And by being united to him by the Spirit, we have a foretaste of that. We have it. It is ours. We can claim it. But we still ache, we still, we still complain, we still sin, we still die. And there is a not yet component of, or, or uh, uh, another professor once put it, don't say not yet, he said, now and more to come, is the way he used to always say it. You have it now, but there's more to come. It's not that we are lacking any, anything in particular, but there's more that we get when Christ returns. And this idea that, that, the, that the victories, the, the establishments, all these things, is not done yet, I say here is because is one of the main reasons why Tolkien leaves sadness laced all the way even to the end. Again, there's, there's no, he is unwilling, whereas Lewis is willing, he's unwilling to, to paint the picture of the, of the end yet because he realizes that none of us even know what that would look like in the fullest sense. We only know the sadness of now. And so even all the way to the end of the story, there's sadness and there's scars and there's brokenness. Not in a way that denigrates the victory of what was won, but in a way that keeps us humble that there will still be more victories that need to be won after this one, etc. Lastly, I've mentioned this, but I want to sort of leave you sort of walking away with this. Throughout Tolkien, there is this concept of what I would call subtle providence. God is somehow at work in the big picture, even when it seems like he's not. Very much a biblical motif, very much in the sense of, of Joseph, you intended this for evil, but, but God intended it for good. Now, I guarantee you when he was in the slave pit, he didn't think that way at first. He was probably thinking, what in the world, God? This idea that he had been sold off into slavery, and he spent such a long time sort of clawing his way back up and trusting God to get him out of it. When he's actually finally at the, at the summit of his restoration, he then can say, God intended this for good, actually. The subtle providence of a long sort of devotion to him often sometimes makes it feel like, as the Puritans once put it, that he's not on the throne for a period of time, that he's, that he's somehow set us down and, and sort of walked away. Now, we know theologically, biblically, he hasn't, but that doesn't stop us from sometimes feeling that way. And we always have to remind ourselves that there is always a subtle providence at work in God's plan, even to the point that sometimes it might seem like he's not quite there. And I'm not going to give you countless examples of this, because I think it's, it's, it's laced throughout, and if you've read the books by this point, you'll probably readily admit, yeah, this is always popping up. Tolkien's not even afraid to use the word fate, even though we don't like that word. Uh, he's not afraid to say there's things that seem almost fateful, like how did it work out so cleanly, or how did, how did this come to fruition in its own way? Well, that, that's the concept of the subtle providence. This, 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 it, it's actually amazing to see God at work weaving the, the threads of the tapestry together, etc. Any questions? They both do. They both mix paganism into the pagan oh, right, stories yeah. in, yeah. Oh, well, you know, Tolkien, I think. No, not if you've read the Silmarillion. It, it's, it, it, this is why I wanted to belabor the Silmarillion. Yeah, when they're sort of sailing off to this sort of heroic undying land, it can feel like he's sort of championing this pagan idea, but he's not. What he's doing is actually weaving the Lord of the Rings to kind of do- dovetail back on the Cimmerillion, because the Cimmerillion is not heaven, and it's not some sort of superstitious world. It's rather the place of waiting for the end, 
if that makes sense. And so what it's supposed to be is that Bilbo and Frodo are given the honor of going to those places that the elves go to, to wait, which is their right and their, their, what they're supposed to do, because they've done such heroic deeds to, to help conquer the, the ring. So, in other words, you can't say that one weaves in non-Christian elements and another one doesn't. They both do. And they both weave in overtly, heavily Christian elements. I mean, Aslan dies and is resurrected and, you know, defeats the White Witch and these kinds of things as well. And in some of the elements of Lewis, he, he will bring in other sort of mythological fairy tales. Now, we were talking about this before at one of the breaks. Where, what is driving this, again, is always remember the context. You're dealing with a rabid materialism of the early 1900s. And what Tolkien and them are saying is not, hey, we like paganism, it's just like Christianity, but rather, if all you guys are going to be as materialistic, we'll stand over here with the weirdos who actually believe in superstitious spiritual things. Now, in today's world, now that we've actually had the New Age movement and lots of sort of goofy, cultish kind of stuff some arising at times, uh, you know, the, as I joked before, you know, there is a Jedi language, there's now a Tolkien, uh, a Jedi religion rather, there are people that are using Harry Potter to develop the sort of religious elements that we just have a, a, an explosion of sort of strange, cultish-type religious subset groups, right? Well, because of that, we, in the 21st century context, feel a lot more icky and a lot more weirded out by incorporating old fairy tales or old sources that are not predominantly Christian into, into fiction, or we might have those, those problems. But I, I think the context of Lewis and Tolkien, they're not... They're not dealing with New Age, they're dealing with materialism. And they're saying, look, I'd rather be over here with Arthurian legends and uh, some of the classical mythologies because at least they understand that the spiritual realm is real. Now, are they saying that they're equal to Christ? No. They always say they're myths, they're just stories, etc. Why? Yeah, it's the, yeah it, is, it really is the age-old question. Why in Lord of the Rings is there no overt... For example, you don't see ritualism, you don't see a church, you don't see... Any concept of God? So the answer is, you either have to say he purposely left it out, or he just thought the story was better without trying to invent religion, if that makes sense. That's always what it comes down to. I tend to think he purposely left it out so that it didn't get confused with as a religious text. He wanted it to be a good literature story first. And so this is why the themes are more subtle. Why they are from a Christian worldview, I would say, but not necessarily from straight out of the Bible, verse by verse. It's the application of biblical worldview to literature, to questions of heroism, these kinds of things. I mean, I've had, I've had people tell me that, they, they, that they, were, they were surprised to find out that Tolkien was a Christian, whereas no one is surprised to find out that Lewis is a Christian, even, just by, even if you just read Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe once, uh, and nothing else. I don't know if Tolkien would be happy with that fact, I do think in his own day, everyone knew he was, I mean, the book is over, I mean, I just think in our day and age, we want our Christianity on our bumper stickers. We want everyone driving behind us to know that we love Jesus. It always has to be sort of uh, big, bold letters, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to that. But I think in Tolkien's day, it was front and center. No one, they, they read Lord of the Rings and knew exactly what was going on, at least from a, from a theological standpoint. I think in our day and age, we have in a, sort of a relatively post-Christian world in some parts of the world. They see a Lambus bread. They have no idea that that's clearly Eucharistic. Tolkien's world, they knew it was Eucharist. They knew that there was some symbolism being, being played out here. So some of it is our distance from Tolkien makes him sort of feel different to us in, in some ways. So.